So can work get any worse? Well, we think it's going to get a bit worse with, uh, with Brexit. Um, I mean, these are just a couple of the, um, uh, the, the, the some, some great quotes recently from uh, the people in Europe who are getting really frustrated at the, uh, at the Brits. Um, this, this was the latest from the German Deputy Foreign Minister the other week. <laughs> Brexit, Brexit is a big shit show. <laughs> <laughs> and you may have seen uh, Donald Tusk, the, the president, saying there's a, there's a special place in hell for people who thought about voting for Brexit. Um, without a sketch of a plan to carry it out safely. The word safely is the interesting thing here because it was obviously a reference to uh, the Irish border um, issue. But, you know, we are really struggling in the UK with um, the whole thing about what the future of work is going to be like, whether workers' rights are going to be protected, because a lot of um, employment protection in the UK um, has come about through um, compliance with European regulations and directives. So I thought this might be a good opportunity to um, reflect on the, you know, the, 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 this project around institutional experimentation for better work. Um, and so I thought, you know, Institutional experimentation, well, we need to think about the institutional context, um, which for us is obviously globalisation in general, if we're going to kind of use that term, um, but the single European market in particular, because that's what kind of drive, it's been driving everything in Europe for quite some time now. Um, the, the current network is, is interdisciplinary, and so I think that, that takes into thinking about institutional theory and the, and the different kind of approaches to that. Um, Part of this, this program is coming up with all these institutional experiments, these kind of cases. So I want to talk about some of the cases that I'm involved in. You know, it's always best, a case to me, it's always best to start at home, and that's exactly what I've been doing, thinking about the, the cases that I've been working on, what, what some of the kind of common themes might be around some of these uh, cases. And then if it's institutional experimentation for better work, better than what? So what's the benchmark that we use to talk about that? And if it's better, it's this active thing that it's actually going to get better than it was in the past, not worse. Um, now, it's actually easy to start with the last thing here, the, you know, the benchmarking or betterment, because in Europe, we have a social agenda. And so we have a very clear idea in Europe about, about what we mean about better, you know, decent work, better work, whatever term you want to move. Um, and that's about promoting employment, improving living and working conditions, so as to make possible their harmonisation while the improvement is being maintained. So it's this idea that things get better and that we bring everybody up to the same level. Whereas if you think about international labour standards, it's making sure that people comply with the minimum. So this is, you know, so in Europe we have a, kind of a different conception about what we mean by better work. And it's all around social protection, so that people should do jobs where they have sick pay, holiday pay, all those kind of traditional forms of protection against unemployment, uh, protection at work, from work, you know, sickness, all those kind of things. Um, and we do things through dialogue um, and, the, and investment in people so that um, people have got the skills to, you know, to, to, to maintain employment in the future. And obviously there's a lot of concern at the moment about the impact of AI and digitisation that's going to make various skills redundant and all the rest of it. <coughs> and, and in Europe we do, there's a lot of discussion about Europe being the knowledge centre, you know, other people can do the low skilled manufacturing stuff, we're going to be the, the knowledge centre and all that kind of stuff. Um, and obviously the Amsterdam Treaty is important in this context because that's one of the things that the Labour government when Tony Blair was elected, one of the first things they did, we signed up to the Amsterdam Treaty. So whereas previously the, the social agenda in Europe was a protocol attached to the treaty, it now became formally part of the treaty and everybody is supposed to uh, comply with it, including the UK, which then means that our employment rights started to improve from uh, 1997. So a couple of years after that, I was the first person at my university to take paternity leave. Not because the British government thought it was suddenly a great idea, but because we had to comply with European regulations and, and offer people paternity leave. So two weeks of work. Um, so this is the idea that um, you know, we think that Europe is different from the rest of the world because of the European social market, um, which, gives, which gives us in Europe a distinct social quality. So when, when we talk about better work, you know, we've got a clear idea about what that means, and both 
been the kind of absolute and this idea of it getting better all the time and bringing everybody up to uh, the same kind of standards. The problem that we have is that um, we've got 28 different labour markets in Europe. Um, and what that means is that you can have what we call social dumping. It, it, it's possible to employ people from one country you know, with, with traditionally lower conditions in another country and that the idea is it dumps social costs on, on, other, on other countries. Um, so it, it actually also opens up a space for companies to, to adopt a deliberate strategy of the opposite. Instead of better work, adopt a deliberate strategy to make worse, work worse um, by using uh, the freedoms that you have in a, in a single market, a single product market, with 28 different labour markets, in order to drive down uh, wages and conditions of employment. And I'll explain how, how firms actually go about, um, go about doing that. Um, so if you think about the, if we come from the, you know, let's start with the institutional context. If you think about the context in Europe, I mean, all the discussion about Brexit at the moment is do we stay in a customs union, all this kind of stuff. Um, at the moment, the 28 member states, with a, everybody's in a single market, which means that we remove trade barriers, we have a common trade policy towards non-member states, and we have free movement of factors of production between member states. So these are the four freedoms of the, of the single market, the free movement of capital, labour, goods and services. So we, this idea of freedom of establishment, you, as, a, as, as a capitalist, you can set up a business any, in any member state, and you, you have freedom to provide services in, in those member states. As a, as a worker, you, 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 know, you can seek employment in any member state of the European Union, etc. Within the, um, uh, the, the, the economic union with, with the euro, we're also harmonising our economic policies under supranational control. So we have a European Central Bank that sets you know, a common interest rate for all the members of, um, of the eurozone. So if you think about all these different countries, they're all embedded into these different kind of trading and other relationships in very different ways around Europe. So in terms of our institutional context that we've got to think about, we have to think about the way in which you know, these different kind of trade and market relationships operate uh, between all these different, different countries. So this is what's causing us real grief at the moment, the common travel area, you know, no border, no hard border in Northern Ireland. Yeah? So there's all these different, so some countries are in the Eurozone, some are not. So the, you know, the UK is outside the, these Eurozones. You've got, when people are talking in the UK about Norway plus, so Norway is in the, the, um, the European Free Trade Agreement, pays into the European Union, complies, you know, apply, you know, um, complies with all the rules and regulations, but doesn't elect uh, people to uh, the European Parliament and all those kind of things. So there's all these different kind of relationships between different countries. So I had a project in Georgia um, recently. Uh, we had a project with the European uh, Bank for Reconstruction and Development who have just given Georgia, um, the Tbilisi Transport Company, a shed load of money to buy these new, new buses. But as part of the agreement, they have to employ more women bus drivers. They had one woman driving a bus in the city of Tbilisi. So as part of the whole process of promoting you know, democracy, inclusion, diversity, all these kind of things, they so, right, you can have all this money, but as part of the deal, you've also got to um, employ women uh, bus drivers. So we set up a training program with one of the local colleges to recruit people and all the rest of it. So, there's, so they get money through all these kind of European institutions by, by which we try and integrate all these, all these different countries in different, kind of, um, uh, in different kinds of relationships. Now, the thing, about, the thing about this is that um, if you think about what's regulated at the EU level, it's all the products and, and capital market regulation. So all the competition rules are set by the European Union and enforced by the European Commission. So the Commission is the guardian of the treaty. So we have competition rules. If, company, if, if companies or countries break the rules, the Commission can take action against them. Companies or countries can be fined. For, for, not, you know, for breaking competition rules. So if you subsidise companies, for example, you know, and you break state aid rules, governments can be fined and all the rest of it. So all this is done at the, at the EU level, all the kind of rules of competition. Um, if you're in the Eurozone, 
then your, your kind of macro policies, you know, in, interest rates, you know, your currency, all those things are outside your control. If you're not in the Eurozone, like the UK, then you can devalue your currency, you know, you can, your interest rates can go up when everybody else's interest rates are going down, etc. But what it means is that everybody gets adjustment through the labour market. So that's the one thing that everybody has, you know, has some leverage over in terms of how you adjust to competition. So if you think about a single currency zone, you've got to have countries that, with similar standards of living. You've got to have synchronised business cycles. You know, these things matter. And Greece is not on the same level as Germany. The, you know, the business cycle is not synchronised. So we have a political decision to include countries in a Eurozone. And then when the shit hits the fan and you have the financial crisis, you know, the, the Greece needs a very different adjustment process to Germany. But there's one interest rate and there's one currency. So what do you do? You kill everybody's pensions and, and all the rest of it. And, and so you, you have to do the adjustment through the, through the labour market. And it's more severe in some countries than others. So if you look at, um, people don't like to use this term, but we have Portugal, um, uh, Italy, Greece and Spain. And we call them the peaks. Okay, they don't, people don't like those. Oh, yeah. No, sorry. Portugal, Ireland, Greece and Spain. Sorry, not Italy. Um, and there's a really interesting paper by Paul Teague that shows that uh, um, Ireland had, because of the more flexible labour market, was able to make the adjustments better than those other countries, you, you know, in response to the financial crisis. So if you look at changes to employment law, pensions and things like that, Ireland was, you know, kind of made less fundamental changes to a lot of those things because of a, a more kind of flexible uh, labour market. But in all these cases, most of these adjustments are coming through the, through the labour market. So the institutional context that we're dealing with is, is very specific in Europe in terms of you know, how, how kind of trade arrangements and other things are regulated between different countries, and then how much scope you have for adjustment when, um, when, you, when you need to. So in the old days, um, we used to have a system of what um, Sharp calls positive integration. So governments decided when trade would be liberalised and for what products uh, and which conditions would permit workers to seek employment and firm services in other member states. And what that allowed you to do was that it allowed you to, to kind of basically keep control of your nationally valued welfare states, your system of industrial relations, public revenues, public services and all the rest of it. Um, so the member states can ensure that markets would only be allowed to expand within politically defined uh, limits that would not disrupt your kind of social consensus, your, your labour laws, all those kind of things within your member state. What the single European market has done, and the way things have changed subsequently, you know, as the EU gets bigger, you need different mechanisms to do things. So if we sit around the table here and decide where we might go for a meal or something, we completely agree on that fairly easily. If we involve everybody, it gets more complicated. You know, you know, as the numbers increase, it gets more difficult to make decisions by unanimity. So what we've um, what we've done in Europe is that we we've been extending the treaty rights to individuals and firms, so that that individual rights and the rights of firms trump collective rights. So we've had a number of uh, cases, disputes where the right of a firm to provide services in another country. When that seems to fall foul of employment laws, it's the, it's the firm's right of establishing, you know, freedom of establishment and the freedom to provide services which trumps the employment rights of workers in those countries. So, the, 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 you know, the, if you think about the rights, it's been balanced towards kind of capital and away from labour. So, when workers have gone on strike, you know, they've said, no, no, the, the, curb, the firm has a right to do this. So, and, and sometimes workers are going on strike. To make sure that all the, 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 they just get paid the same as they the, the would in that particular country in terms of um, in terms of their employment standards, um, we then also have a system of qualified majority voting, and qualified majority of voting has been extended over a wider range of issues. So, in the transport sector, for example, we did this in 1992 as a general principle, and then it's been extended. Um, since. So what it means is that the majority of countries can, 
can, you know, can force everybody else to, to comply. And what, that, and what that means is that because the Commission is the guardian of the treaty and competition rules, is that if you push through regulatory reforms, if the countries that can't cope with that are then subject to infringement procedures by the Commission and forced to comply with everybody else. So you might not be as efficient as everybody else, your firms might not be able to compete, so the government might be subsidising them or, or, or offering them various forms of support. If you do that and fall foul of it, so it, so it, it kind of, in a sense, it speeds up this whole process of extending the, um, the market. Why on earth we didn't apply a similar qualified majority voting rules to the referendum in the UK for Brexit, I will never know. You know, which would be that every country had to, you know, had to vote in favour and you had to have at least three quarters, anyway. Um, what we also do as well is, is this, 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 this idea of mutual recognition. Um, and so basically what, the way in which you kind of extend the market, if you try and get everybody to, to have the same regulations for everything, it becomes impossible. So for example, you, you couldn't import um, Oh, sorry, export pasta to, to Italy unless it was made of durum wheat. You had to call it something other than pasta. So these are all these kind of rules and regulations. And so if it's, if it's produced legally and, and safely in your country, you can call it pasta and, and export it elsewhere. So you take away a lot of those, all, the, all those kind of non-tariff barriers. So again, if you think about Brexit, it's very easy to say, well, what's the tariff going to be? It's 5%, it's 10%. It's, it's all the other regulations that, that are you know, kind of quite difficult. So the idea that we would trade with America in agricultural products, everybody's getting really upset about that because in America they feed cattle with steroids or something. I don't know what they mean. But, you know, so, uh, whereas you can't in Europe because our, regular, our, our environmental standards and everything else are, are much stricter. And so the thing is, and, and that's the whole, the whole kind of part of this. So this is what we would call negative integration, where you, um, you basically shift from a system of, of structure to conduct regulation. So the idea of conduct regulation is you, you say ex ante who can participate in the market. And one of the things that we used to say was that you couldn't participate in the market unless you recognised a trade union or unless you, you, know, you, 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 you paid union rates or, or whatever. Um, those kind of things are now illegal. Um, and so what we do with the conduct regulation, if we basically say it's an open market, you can do whatever you want, basically, and then we regulate you post hoc, when your behaviour is deemed to be anti-competitive. Now it's much more difficult to define anti-competitive behaviour and then try and you know, enforce it. So if you think about workers' rights, if you think that your employment rights are being violated, you then got to take a case and, and show that the firm is not complying with, with standards and things like that. So it's post hoc rather than, you know, kind of um, ex ante forms of, um, of regulation. And of course, if it was left to the, you know, the neoliberals, it would be competition where possible, regulation only where absolutely necessary, which they would define as some kind of market failure. What that is, I don't know. Um, so that's the kind of context in which we're operating in, in, in Europe, the way in which the, you know, the market is being um, extended. Um, is there this question about, you know, if we're talking about institutional experimentation, what, what does that mean? What, what do we mean by institutional theory? Um, and I think this is a, quite a nice summary from a paper by Vivian Smith, which, which looks at different types of institutionalism. So we've got the kind of the rational choice institutionalism, which a lot of political scientists are into, but economists, I mean, I, I, I confess that I typically think in this way as an economist. I always think about what are the incentives, you know, what, what would a rational person do? Then you think, well, nobody's behaving rational, so you, you very quickly think of other things, but, you know, that's the kind of default kind of position that you, that you, that you go to. The historical institutionalism, the kind of thing that we're used to, this idea of path dependency, so, you know, if you think about all this stuff on legal origins, you know, you start with a particular legal system and that then favours, if you're a, a common law system, it favours market-based outcomes over state-determined outcomes and things like that. So there's all this, you know, this historical institutionalist kind of literature about path dependencies and the way that countries get locked into particular ways of doing things. 
that this kind of sociological or organizational institution is based much more around norms of behavior that, that emerge through social interaction about what is acceptable forms of behavior, which then creates all kinds of constraints and opportunities on firms. And then Vivian Smith is an advocate of discursive institutions, mainly, mainly because um, uh, she sees this as the, as, as the way in which change is, is, um, is initiated. So you see this, the process change, static, 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 and dynamic. I, 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 no, no, I don't buy into that. There's lots of work in, in other institutionalist fields about you know, policy entrepreneurs and, and all this kind of stuff. But it, it does, it's, it's a nice way of thinking about this whole idea of how do we think about change and the way in which um, you know, processes of change, you know, the experimentation comes about. That, that creates you know, opportunities for better work or, or maybe worse work. Now, what I've been think, thinking about is, is thinking about this in the context of our discipline of kind of industrial relations, human resource management, this, this kind of field. Um, and the fact that a lot of what we do in um, the kind of human resource management field in particular is very much decontextualized. So it looks, look, looks at what goes on inside the firm. So a lot of the theory that, that, that people deal with in the strategic HR field is based on the resource-based view of the firm. So it's the idea that, that firms are more likely to get competitive advantage from the resources that they already own rather than resources that they acquire from strategic factor markets. And the general argument is that the better you are at human resource management, the more you're likely to have better performance. We all know the kind of story. Uh, so you invest in people, their skills go up and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you go back to the resource-based theory of the firm, Barney's work, it's based on Ricardian rent theory. And the reason for that is fairly obvious, that R Ricardo's theory of rent uh, was, is based on the inelastic supply of land. So the argument is that you, if you've got a, a population of 100, let's say you need 10 hectares of land to feed 100 people. So you start with the most fertile land. As the population grows, if you get to a population of 200, you don't need 20 hectares, you might need 23 hectares because you know, you know the, the land is less fertile. So the price is set by the 23rd hectare that you've got to cultivate because that's the cost of, of, of actually feeding people. So the people who are cultivating the original land with higher product, you know, fertility, their costs are the same, but now the price is higher. So they're making an economic rent. Okay? It's, a, it's a rent <coughs> over and above the, the, the normal return to the market. And it's this idea that if you invest in people, you, you, know, you get a return from, from them. So you can see why, they, why, why the resource-based view gravitates towards Ricardo's um, theory of uh, rent. And, and the idea of this above normal return on the firm's investment. The thing is that when you go to the original resource-based view of the firm, there are two ways in which firms can create a rent. So one is through resource picking. So it's through strategic factor markets. So if I've got better access to, the, to a factor market, to a particular labor market, for example, then I could get, a be I could get rent. So if you think about certain markets and the way they're regulated, um, think about Premiership Football in the UK. Certain firms, certain clubs, can buy better players than others because they've got more money, but also they've got the reputation. The best players want to go and work for them. If you think about a lot of fund companies, they can select better labour from the labour market. So in the resource-based view, they assume that factor markets are perfectly competitive. But in fact, you know, we all know labour markets are not, are not competitive. So firms can either exploit or create imperfections in these markets. So just, just think about the law could be a strategic factor market. If I operate in a single product market with 28 different labour markets and different labour laws, I can select the most favourable law and that then becomes a strategic factor that I can exploit. And under the Treaty of Rome, firms in, the, in Europe are allowed to choose whichever law they want, as long as it's not to the detriment of, of the applicable law. Okay. So I'll, we'll, we'll come on and explain this later. But it means that the labour market is a strategic factor, the law is a strategic factor, and therefore, by picking resources, selecting resources in certain ways, firms can make rents, they can make above normal profits. 
The other, the other approach, which is the one that people talk about all the time, is, is capacity building. It's investing in human resources, teamwork, and all that kind of nonsense that we, you know, that we read about all the time. If you've got, if you're making a rent, if you're making above normal profit, what does that mean? It means you can share it with your workforce. How do you share it? You share it through collective bargaining. Yeah. Ricardo's theory of rent and also Marx's theory of rent assume that the landlord could appropriate all the rent. As soon as workers have got some bargaining power, they, you've got rent sharing. So the, arg the argument is, are some capitalists able to appropriate all the rent? Are they able to use strategic factor markets in a way to make money and take all the profit to the detriment of the workers that they, uh, that they employ? So traditional Ricardian rents come from selecting resources from these strategic factor markets where, these, you know, where you've got inherent variation in factor quality. Non-traditional Ricardian rent is about building firm-specific investments with evolved variation because you know, people work together, you get a good team and all that kind of stuff and you know, the usual HRM stuff. But then there's also this idea of entrepreneurial rent and that's about human agency in dealing with uncertainty. So and we all know that some firms are just run by really smart people, or, or maybe sometimes really nasty people, who are, who are just better at anticipating what the market's going to do or, or developing uh, new products. So this is this idea of um, where the rents come from. So if this inelastic factor supply coupled with variations in factor quality, and you can obtain those markets because you've got some monotony power. So, Economists talk about a monopolist who is a single seller, a monopolist is a single buyer. So as a buyer in the market, I've got buying power in the market. Either because I'm Manchester United or, or because I'm the only buyer of a certain type of labour. You know, there's something about, about me as a buyer where I've created some imperfection in this market that gives me an advantage. So the non-traditional Ricardian rents are this, you know, how do we create firm-specific immobile investments across firms? Well, we create you know, heterogeneity through getting people to work together, the path dependency, which, you know, obviously draws on this idea of historical institutionalism, that, you know, why is it that... There was a great quote from this guy, Len Peach, who was the um, HR or personnel director, the young one used to call them personnel directors, um, of IBM in the UK, and they said, how do you create a culture like IBM's? And he said, start 20 years ago. So this idea that, you know, it, it all goes back to the, the way which you started the business and all that kind of stuff. And then there's the entrepreneurial events. Uh, this idea of, um, you know, exceptional foresight, all these, uh, all these kind of things. Now, I think this is actually quite, quite important because, um, you know, we talk about institutional entrepreneurs and, or, or policy makers and things like this, and Glenn Morgan and, and others have, have written about this. In the resource-based view of the firm, we talk about resources that are valuable, rare, inimitable, non-substitutable, and exploitable through organisation. So it seems to me that this is much more than um, the O in, in the, the, you know, the Vreno bit of resource-based theory. Because it's all about two things. It's about um, Schumpeterian, you know, the, the kind of the products that completely transform the way we think and live and work, things like this, mobile phones, that, that just kind of completely changes the nature of the market. Um, low fares airlines, you know, you can think about products or services that just completely change, Amazon, you know, the way that they just completely transform, Uber, they just completely transform the nature of the market. And then also the, the, um, the what we would call market arbitrage, the, where firms think of a a different way of making a, a process that reduces your cost. So it's the same product, but we've got a process innovation that means our costs are lower. Or we've got, a, with, a, with a process, we can make a different product, you know, something that gives you a, a certain buying power. So it's about, it's, and, and, this, and this process, if you think about it, is both economic, it creates markets, but it's also institutional as well, because it throws up new challenges about how we regulate the market. Facebook is a great example of that, isn't it? The way people are using data. And all of a sudden we're going, hold on a minute. I didn't think you were going to use our personal data for advertising or various other things. And so we're now thinking about creating institutions and rules to, to kind of govern that. So markets are created by entrepreneurs. 
But they're defined by government, they're ordered by institutions, and they're governed by rules and regulations. At some point, governments have got to say, whoa, wait a minute, we want to draw a boundary around this market. And we want institutions to, to, you know, to kind of govern what goes on, and we're going to create all these, um, all these rules and regulations. And quite often, when you get these firms, it's about breaking the existing rules. So if you think about what Uber does, they're breaking the rules of what it is to be a taxi driver. They're operating a taxi service, but they say, no, no, it's not a taxi service. You know, it's not a meter and stuff like that. So they're challenging the rules and reinterpreting the rules and changing our norms, our expectations about, about what things are. And obviously, the, if you think about the discursive thing, the way they talk about these things is actually quite important because they don't say it's a taxi service. They, they try and say it's something else, which is you know, how, what, what Vivian Smith says would be quite important about these, about these things. So the key thing is, if it, how do these firms um, appropriate the rent? So if we've got, if, you know, if we've got rent sharing, and we've got, you know, unions negotiating contracts, and we've got social progress, better conditions of work. If we've got rent seeking, where firms have monopsony power, non-unionism and bad working conditions are social dumping, then we get worse work. Um, and so one of my colleagues who I work with, Geraint Harvey, they, they did a paper on their uh, fitness trainers in gyms. <laughs> and they likened the work of these people to the old, um, the, the villains in, you know, the, in feudal times. And the things that characterised these people is that there, there, was, there, were, there was some form of debt bondage. There was no, there's no guaranteed income, so you don't know how much you're going to earn that week. And if you think about fitness instructors in gyms, you know, it depends whether they've got any clients. You often make payments to work. So you're actually paying a rent to actually work. So you, you're actually paying the gym to actually be able to go and use the facilities and things like that. And then you do work for free. So you keep the gym tidy because you want to, you know, you, you put the weights back and you know, people leave them on the floor and, and, and do stuff like this. So it's this idea that, that instead of better work, we can actually have forms of work that kind of go back to old kind of, kind of feudal type uh, conditions. So where does that get me to? <laughs> this gets me to thinking about what kind of cases have we got, okay? So we've got our context, we've got some of these theoretical ideas that we try and think about these things. And then we think about, well, what cases do we, do we pick to show how work can get better or, or stop work getting, getting worse? So the firms that I've been looking at, when I've been thinking about this, we've been thinking about, well, these are all really profitable firms. That's one of the key characteristics of these firms. And when you look at the literature on, on the profitability of firms, the firms that make consistently high profits are actually very few and far between over time. So they beat some rather long gods. There's something really interesting about these firms. Um, and quite often these are the firms that, you know, you get these little uh, vignettes in these books on human resource management, you know, about how Southwest is a wonderful employer and how Google gets all their employees together to, you know, to, to network and have cooler, water cooler conversations and stuff like that. There's a great quote from um, um, a British labour lawyer, Otto Kahn Freud, who basically says, well, um, we actually have a lot to learn from the abnormal, the pathological situation. Oh, don't you love that word? The pathological situation. Now, lawyers would, would think about, about this, obviously, because they deal with the extreme cases quite often. You know, the unusual cases that don't, don't fit the law, those are the ones that, that go to court. Um, and I think there's a lot, you know, there is a lot to learn from, from case studies. And there's, this, there's a great paper by uh, Ben Flyberg on the misunderstandings of case studies and about how we can actually use cases to, you know, to develop theory. Um, and I think one of the interesting things is there's a little kind of piece by, I can't really pronounce this, this geezer's name. Um, but it's, on about, it's about writing case studies. It's one of these little short pieces that appeared in the Academy of Management Journal. Um, and he basically said, you know, if somebody came to you and said, I've got a flying pig, you wouldn't say, oh, yeah, but how many flying pigs are there? You know, is it a representative of pigs in general? You'd go, blimey, you've got a flying pig, you know. You tell me all about it. How does it manage to fly? Or there's this guy called uh, Phineas Cage who worked on the railways. And his job was the, um, you know, when they were doing blasting and stuff, and they mixed the, the gunpowder and... Uh, and sand, and he forgot the sand, and there was a spark, and the gunpowder exploded, and the railway bolt went through his head, and he, and he basically took out the front of his head. He looked, fortunately, he survived, 
but of course it changed his behaviour because it whacked out a bit of his frontal lobe. And, and so they learned a lot from the fact that, you know, they knew that bits of his brain had been, had been destroyed, and then they realised that bits of the brain control different types of behaviour. Now you can't go, okay, that was interesting, Peter, I'm just going to smash your head open <laughs> and see what happens, see if you become any grumpier than you are already. <laughs> and so, you know, so the fact that we've got unusual cases, you know, I think we should, you know, what I'm basically saying is, a lot of the companies that I work with seem to be kind of quite extreme and a bit nasty, but we can actually learn quite a lot from that. That's basically the point I'm, I'm trying to, to make here. And so if I think about, the, you know, in Europe and the, the idea of um, the mobility and capital labour within this, I kind of focus on a lot of these transport companies where both capital and labour is mobile. So they are kind of unusual. But what it means is that the firms that operate can, can find the, what we would call spaces of exception. They can find these regulatory gaps and exploit them to create imperfections in the labour market and actually then create super profits. Not by developing human resources, sharing rents, investing in people, doing team working, all the nice HR stuff that they tell us about, but they do it by making traditional Ricardian rents. That's what they do. And they're a bit extreme, and it's a bit unusual because they're in this kind of category. But that, I would argue that that doesn't negate the fact that, you know, you can't just say, oh, well, it's just a flying pig, isn't it? I mean, he was interested in what we are interested in, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit different. So, um, what I've got is, um, I want to very quickly just talk about um, four sectors where we've been doing work, maritime, aviation, road transport, passenger transport. So in the maritime sector, we've got flags of convenience ships in sailing around Europe now on, on short sea shipping routes. In aviation, we've got these ultra-low cost airlines. In road transport, we've got what we call letterbox companies, where you have a Dutch company that registers a business in Bratislava, and I've been to these office blocks in Bratislava, where there's an office and four or five plaques on the wall, and there's just one person in reception, and they set up a business there. And then they employ labour through a manning agency in Cyprus or somewhere else. To, and then they employ East European drivers. So they, they we're called letterbox companies. It's a postal address, you know, like a, like a PO box. Um, and then passenger transport, where we've got, um, you know, all the stuff on platform capitalism, the different, you know, advertising platforms and, and the other types. These are the lean platforms like Uber, Airbnb. And there's a company I'm going to talk about called Flixbus, which, which kind of falls into this particular um, category. So in each of these cases, we can think about, do they have not any power? Are they able to you know, exploit or create imperfections in, in the strategic factor markets that allow them to make these super profits? Are they neo-villains? And then what are the kind of characteristics of the bad word? What's the kind of bad word? So this was a, a study that we did on short sea shipping in the Western Mediterranean. Um, and basically what we found is that an increasing number of flags of convenience, so European ships, you know, actually flagging out, and in this, this is obviously an extreme case because most of them are using the Panamanian flag or Liberian flags. They're not using, some of them have got second registry in Europe, so Cyprus, for example, would be classified as a flag of convenience. And then they're increasingly employing crews of convenience, a lot of Albanian seafarers, but also uh, Filipinos. So one of the interesting things now is that the, the European Commission has basically given up on trying to get European seafarers on some of these ships. So what we've done instead is we now license training schools in the Philippines so that at least we know that the, the seafarers who are coming have got a proper seafaring certificate and not a bogus certificate that they've got from some dodgy college. Mutual recognition of qualifications, this idea of, well, if they've been trained over there, then they're fine, they can come and work over here. And as long as we're happy that they're being trained, you know, anyway. So, what are we concerned about? Well, the fact that these people have got these licenses from these dodgy places. They're often paying agent fees to come and work in Europe. Um, a lot of them are not being paid or they get late payment. They work lots of additional hours and don't get paid. Most of them are on fixed term contracts. They're non-union workers um, and there's no collective agreement. So most flag of convenience ships, or I think probably is the majority now, 
there's an International Transport Workers Federation and the International Maritime Employers Committee who, who negotiate a collective agreement for these, you know, for, for ships, which sets out basic terms and conditions. A lot of these vessels don't even have in Europe. In Europe, don't even have these uh, these certificates. So what we were able to do, we looked at every ship sailing in the Western Mediterranean. And you can get these things from databases. There's a, a database called SeaWeb. And it tells you all the ships, actually tells you where they are. We then matched that up with the two other databases. There's a, um, the Memorandum of Understanding from the, the Paris Memorandum of Understanding about uh, uh, ship inspections. And then there's also another database called Equasis, which looks at all the detentions and stuff. So you actually know whether these ships have been detained in port because of violations of standards. And what we also, they do, they classify them as general kind of uh, violations of standards, so, you know, safety or whatever, and then also human element deficiencies. So those would be inadequate training of crew, um, no knowledge of evacuation procedures, poor accommodation, things like that. The flag of convenience ships are twice as likely as the non-flag ships to have detentions and to have human element, element deficiencies. So it's clear that, these, that when firms are able to you know, exploit the market and create these kind of conditions, you get bad work. We get worse work, not better work. So that's our maritime example. Um, I'm sure people have heard me talk about Ryanair and Michael O'Leary. So here's our entrepreneur up in the, uh, up in the picture there with his uh, annual uh, calendar. Um, Michael O'Leary owns horses, and I actually backed one of his horses on the Grand National this weekend, and he won. It's the first time I've ever won anything from Ryanair. Um, so Ryanair employs cabin crew from, from across Europe. Most of these um, cabin crew, they want to get into the profession, but Ryanair is the only person hiring. Nearly all the traffic growth has been through low-cost airlines. So these people are often quite desperate for, you know, for, for jobs. And they also hire qualified but inexperienced pilots. So they'll hire pirates with, pirates with 200 hours of flying experience rather than 1,500 hours of other airlines. So if you think about your access to the labour market, you've created an imperfection. I'm sourcing labour with inherent differences in quality. They're qualified but inexperienced, and therefore you can pay them less. So you make the st all the staff, the cabin crew, the pilots, they, they pay for their own training cost. There are penalty clauses in, in the contract. So if you think about these people are basically been bonded to the, to the airline because they've got to pay their, the, 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 the training cost back. And if they leave early beyond the termination, beyond their contract, they have a penalty in the contract. So for cabin crew, it's 200 euros. For pilots, it's 5,000 euros if you fail to work your notice. Um, they pay for their own uniforms, so you pay to work, you know, you actually pay for your own uniform, you hire the uniform, so for cabin crew it costs them 30 euros a month for their, for their uniform hire. They're on zero hours contract, so they've got the unstable income. They only get paid for the, for the scheduled flight time, so if the flight takes longer, you don't get paid. So there's unpaid labour. So, you know, bad weather, you, you get delayed, you don't get paid for that, you just get paid for the scheduled flight time. Um, there's incentive pay for selling things on the, on the plane, so again, other indications of variable earnings. And then you get all the unpaid labour, the pilots who report early to do the pre-flight checks, the cabin crew, when you land, you're then not being paid, but you've got to clean the aircraft, so you're doing unpaid, uh, unpaid labour. So these people are on agency contracts, they're on supposedly self-employed contracts, They've got very low wages. Um, in a lot of countries, they're actually being paid less than the national minimum wage. And because they're on Irish contracts, again, is the labour market, is the law a strategic factor? Yes, I can put them all on Irish contracts, and I can select the law, because their place of work is the aircraft, and the aircraft is registered in Ireland, so I can, I can make this fictitious argument. I can bend the, you know, try and create this new norm about you know, the interpretation of the law, say everybody's on an Irish contract, even though you've got a Bulgarian worker based in Spain flying to Germany on an Irish contract. So you use the, the, the strategic factor market of the law to your advantage. Ireland has much lower corporation tax, much lower employment rights than other countries. Um, you, it's, it's the easiest country probably not to have a union. Um, so, you know, they get away with all these kind of things. Um, 
and people don't have a home base. Um, you know, we have a law in Europe that um, your 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 terms and conditions should be based on the country, on the on the place where you work from. And so you've got to where where do I work from? You know, so unless you actually take a case to court and challenge Ryanair over the place where you work from, you know, so it's it's all thing again. It's behaviour in the market. It's all after the event. You know, the the kind of conduct behaviour. Um, Oh, road transport, a lot of things of, of uh, road passenger transport. Um, in 2013, Germany um, deregulated the domestic bus market. 2013. Um, so previously, all long distance bus com uh, services were provided by the National Rail Company. And that was to make sure, you know, to, to regulate competition between railways and buses and also to provide integrated services. So they deregulated the market, said anybody could do it. This new company had been is Flixbus. Within four years, it had over 90% of the German bus market. So again, same as Uber. And if you read Nick, what's his call? Nick Cernet, who's written the book on platform capitalism. Basically, all these platforms depend on monopoly. You know, they, they, they grow at exponential, um, exponential rates. So, what, so Flixbus doesn't employ any drivers, it doesn't own any coaches. It subcontracts all this stuff to independent coach companies. They have to paint their coaches in the Flixbus colours, these really gaudy... Um, this is actually Megabus from the UK. This is, you can see here, it's actually owned by Flixbus, that's a Flixbus thing. This is a, a, a bus that crashed into a tunnel in uh, Paris, so this was a London to Paris um, service, and the bus, uh, the bus driver was tired and dirty. Uh, you know, went into the wall. Nobody died, so I don't mind showing this uh, particular picture. So what we know, we did a survey of um, nearly 700 long-distance bus and coach drivers. Um, basically, these people, again, are breaking the law. Um, they are not getting proper rest periods. Um, they are working during their daily rest. They're not getting sufficient rest between periods. They're not getting the right weekly rest. Um, so they are consistently violating the working time regulations. We also know from vehicle inspections that they, when they do vehicle inspections in, uh, in Europe, they have an inspection week, so they, you know, they suddenly do inspections, and so there's all these police, maybe police officers, depending on the country, and they pull over co coaches and trucks. When they, and, they, and they have um, focus weeks, so they focus maybe on weight limitations or safety or, their, or the tachograph. The only time there's any statistically significant difference between the, the violations that they spot and the violations that they're looking for is when they look for working time violations. So when they look for overloaded vehicles, they don't find any more than they would normally in a normal inspection week. But when they target working time, the numbers go up you know, quite significantly. I mean, I've got the numbers somewhere. And, and that's a statistically significant difference. So in other words, people get away with breaking labor laws. All the, you know, all the time. That, that's basically what they do. They're, they're basically breaking the law and forcing people to do that. So drivers end up with, with fatigue. Um, the, the, the agency drivers, the non-union drivers, they're much more likely not to have any health insurance, sick pay, holiday pay. They're more likely to be sleeping on the coach. You know, when they're taking their rest periods, they end up sleeping on the on, on, on the actual bus. And obviously that then leads to to fatigue and, and, uh, and things like this. Um, and then the final one is road haulage. Um, so these are our, our letterbox companies. There's our letterbox. Um, uh, so these are East European drivers at, um, at a, a parking space, not a proper parking space. So these drivers will typically work for um, between three and 12 weeks in, in Europe. So they'll, be, they'll work for some letterbox company. Um, they'll be hired to work in say Germany, that's for example, so they might be hired by a Dutch company through, you know, through some manning agency from Cyprus, and then they'll work and live in the coach for up to 12 weeks, so typically between 3 and 12 weeks. So they're in a cab that is typically not more than 2 metres square. Um, prisoners you know, in jails in Europe have a, have a human right to 6 metres of space. So bus drivers, uh, you know, uh, truck drivers get a, a third of the space. Because of their wages, and because they only get paid a basic wage, they only get tax and insurance and stuff on this basic wage of a few hundred euros a, a week. 
Um, so we can't afford to park in proper parking areas that are secure, where there are showers and sleeping arrangements. So they end up sleeping in the car, cooking and eating all their food in these kind of uh, places. Um, so again, we've got systematic non-recording of working time. They're working during their breaks. They're, they're loading and unloading, uh, driving during their breaks. So a lot of them are on dual contracts. So they'll, you know, they'll have a, a contract from their Dutch employer in Dutch, and then they'll have a Polish one. And when the unions have done translations, there's significant differences. You know, the ones that they'll show the regulators, the Dutch contract will be in compliance. The one that they give to the worker is completely uh, different. They're, they're living in the trucks and suffering from, from, um, from high levels of, of fatigue. So in all these cases, you can see how firms are able to exploit the labour market. You know, the one bit that you can, <laughs> that you, that where you can exploit the, the differences by choosing the law, by, by creating some imperfection in the labour market, and then exploiting the, um, you know, the open market and, and the freedom to provide services. Now, again, if you think about you combine that with technology. So for these truck drivers, in Europe, the rules say that every time you cross an international border, you can then do three domestic journeys within the next five days. So what these drivers will do is they'll go from, say, Germany to Denmark, then they'll do three local deliveries. So the local delivery might be going from one place to another, but I might do three or four drop-offs on the way. And then I can do another delivery. So they're basically displacing domestic dr drivers as well, as well as international drivers. So if you look at the number of, for example, Danish uh, truck drivers, it's absolutely plummeted in the last decade. Um, and because companies can use all the IT and everything else, they can schedule all these deliveries and everything really well and just keep people driving and then crossing the border, doing domestic journeys in Germany, crossing the border, doing domestic Germany journeys there. And what, there's, what the proposal is for now is every time you cross, for further deregulation, every time you cross the border, unlimited journeys within seven days, whereas three and five at the moment. So you know, all the time, they're just making it more and more and more easy for these firms to give them access to the market, which creates these kind of social and, um, and labor problems. So this is this thing of, you know, we know that this is a problem. What happens when uh, the firm's ability to think up new forms of exploitation is one, head, one step ahead of the legislator, yeah? When you go to conduct regulation, people reinterpret the law, and they're always you know, we're always chasing our tails trying to find out how to, how to regulate these people. Or when the spread of markets outpaces the abilities of societies and their political systems to adjust to them, let alone guide the course that they take. And the argument is that the imbalance can't be maintained for long. Carl Polanyi made the argument, and you know, we see that now, with people getting increasingly frustrated with the way the European Union works, and you know, we get all this, you know, we have 60,000 um, East European truck drivers in the UK. Well, we know who they are because they've got a different registration number. They're driving on the wrong side of the road. So they're, they are, they're having more accidents and they're all parked in laybys all the time because they can't go to parking areas. So whenever you're driving home at night in the UK, you just go past lines and lines and lines of trucks. And it's, you know, it's that kind of it's like Europe in your face, isn't it, all the time? Um, not because yours is a bad thing, but because people are not are breaking, uh, uh, employers are breaking the rules all the time. Um, so, this is, uh, this is one of my little um, pet things at the moment. He's going back to John Commons, who, who uh, talked about the law of industrial relations is that union organisation and collective bargaining tends to follow the contours of the market. And the problem is, once you go beyond the boundaries of the sovereign nation state, it's really difficult to do that. And it allows employers to violate you know, national laws of industrial relations by choosing their law, choosing which law they would most like to work under, and then reinterpreting those laws. So you get this decoupling of the, the development of the, of the product market from your ability to, to regulate the market through, you know, through the labour market. So instead of that positive process of integration that Sharp talked about, we're getting, we're getting this negative integration or this, this, this detrimental form of, of, of integration where people are uh, are being exploited, and we can't keep up with it. You know? And it creates all these kind of all these social problems and social costs on different uh, on different societies and different countries. And then people get you know, as you can imagine, get um, get wound up by it all. 
So this is a great quote from Commons. Uh, Evidently, the wide extension of the market in the hands of the merchant capitalist, I think it's called transnational corporations, is a cataclysm in the position of the journeyman or the modern day worker, gig workers. Um, and it's like, yeah, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. You know, it's that kind of. It's, we, we know that's the case. It, it's that, you know, it's that kind of thing. Of, well, we know this. It's been, it's been going on for quite a long time, and, uh, and that's where we are. So. What I've been trying to do with mine, you know, in terms of the context of the of the, the better work thing, is I, I feel kind of you know we talk about better work, and every everyone I'm talking about is worse work, but because they are these kind of outliers in some respects, these are the flying pigs. But we actually learn a lot from these companies because they're able to you know do the things that we don't think most firms are, are able are able to do because of the way they can exploit the market because of the nature of their business. And I'm not sure whether these are on a continuum of other firms. You know, if I go back to one of the things that we're, we're thinking about doing at the moment, is actually putting a research group together to look at all these different sectors and look at you know, the impact of capital labour mobility. So if you think about agriculture, for example, we've got labour that's really mobile now, that's moving into agriculture in different, in different countries through migration. So, it's, you know, so the, the, the capital is still immobile, it's still in the UK, but they're then exploiting labour in different ways and, and, and using different, you know, different employment contracts to, to do these things. So we, what we think we need to do is look at all these different you know, types of sectors and look at how you know, different forms of capital and labour are creating better or worse work in, 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 across these different, different sectors. And what it is about the nature of some of these markets that, that, allows, you know, that allows for better work or, or creates conditions for, um, for worse work. Um, unfortunately, my contribution is all, is all these negative ones, but you know, that's, that's just where I've landed, I suppose. So, um, so here we are. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>